Okay, today's lesson is a, a kind of a general one, even though our theme is on family. It's a little more general, the choices we make. And of course, you know that. By the way, I, I'll be frank, I have been thinking about uh, some of the points they made here. Obviously, we make choices all the, t- all the time. Uh, and most often without thinking, correct? You don't even think it's habits. I talked with somebody this week who admitted, I know I should, but I'm so used to doing <laughs> okay, habits. <laughs> I know I need to, but it just, you, you don't even think about them. It's just the way we are and the way we do things. Uh, the problem is, thank you, the challenge is that uh, the choices we make often impact not just ourselves, but our families. And uh, if you, I'm going to share a couple of things I've never shared in this church uh, about my own family, because this year I've been thinking about it. My sister, and we'll get to that in a little bit, she would have been 70 years of age this year, 7-0. But uh, she passed away at 25. And I've never shared in this church, but today's lesson on choices made me think about her because I've been reflecting on her since she would have been 70 this year. I've been thinking about my only sister, no brothers, my only sister, Pamela, was her name. I looked up to her, loved my sister. She was just a wonderful person. But here's the, uh, so the choices we make impact others, and, and, and I'm going to share a little bit about my sister, the sister that uh, is like my only sibling that I really love. Fortunately, the lesson starts with this introduction. Fortunately, there is forgiveness. Okay. Now, let me ask you, which is harder, to forgive others or to forgive yourself? That's right. That's, it's like, you know, <laughs> because part of it may be because of the way we are. We say, oh, yeah, I'll forgive you. And in my mind, that was really dumb of you to do that, or you should have known better. But we, it's hard for us to realize we've done such stupid things. We've been so crazy. We've made mistakes, and we wish we had done other. But fortunately, there's forgiveness, there's redemption healing, and from some of the worst decisions we have ever made. Uh, Forgive me, by the way, I haven't had a chance to greet a few of you in person as you came in today. We were trying to get our system going, and uh, we we, we hope we've got it on a backup system. You can see there, I'm going to share at the end of our study uh, simple uh, steps on making choices. Now, you are aware that there are some uh, Christian denominations that do believe that human beings actually don't have a choice. You're aware of that, right? God chooses, and, and, and too bad. He decides who will be saved, who will be lost. Uh, that's a well-known factor, unfortunately, amongst others. But uh, just so to uh, remind us, we as Seventh-day Adventists believe we have freedom to choose, freedom to make decisions Freedom to know whether we want to serve God or not. Um, God has chosen us, yes. <laughs> He's chosen everyone for salvation. But uh, in the end, we have the choice to accept that salvation or not. And uh, that's a reality. Making the right choices. I want to talk about this, and I want us to read some Bible verses. Are you ready uh, to open your uh, Bibles? Because we're going to read about how to make choices. Um, very important. Just about a week ago, 10 days ago, I was talking with a gentleman. He's in his 80s. And he shared with me his own uh, journey about the choices he has made. By the way, uh, in the meantime, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And whoever's going to read it, you raise your hand. And then we'll we'll get people who will open up the different verses. 1 Thessalonians. And we're not going to read it right away, but who is willing to read it? Raise your hand and I can choose somebody else for the next verse. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nobody's raised their hand yet. Okay, there's a hand back there. Then James 1.5. Okay, Kenny will read James, James 1.5. And then after James 1.5, I want somebody to go to Isaiah 1 verse 19. Isaiah 1 verse 19 on the left here. Thanks, Patty. Then Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 and 25. Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, Patty's got Isaiah. Would you take uh, Psalm, uh, Dora, Psalm 119 verse 105? Okay, and one more pie, one more, and then one more person. Second uh, Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. Just have these ready, 
I'm going to tell you about this gentleman. Second, thanks, Wendy. Second Timothy. And I guess we'll just keep going. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of these are so well-known. We could say them by memory if we've memorized them. Uh, well-known passages. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And just hold your um, hand there till we come to the verses. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Brad. And then one more. Isaiah 58, verse 11. Isaiah 58, verse 11. I'm looking this side. Yeah, good. Okay. All right, good. We'll keep those. Now, this gentleman I was talking with, don't read the verses yet. Yours, Dorothy, was, was 119, verse 105. Isaiah. 105. Yes, 105. All right. Uh, I'll come back to in case. So, um, I, I was talking with him, and he told me his story. This was the last week. 87 years of age is his age right now. And he told me how, I'm going to make this in a two minute story. It took about an hour or so in all telling me the story. We met for two and a half hours, and he was telling me his story. Very sad story, in a sense, how he didn't feel called into the ministry, but they encouraged him. He went in, and he said, I made a mess of it. Then he didn't feel called into teaching, but somebody said, you'd make a good teacher. He went in, and he made a mess of it. And he told me, uh, I couldn't believe how many. And he said, I was there for seven years, and it was just a disaster. And he said, I couldn't believe how many disasters he'd made in his life. And he says, I was listening to other people, but I didn't feel that God was leading me there. And I went because they persuaded me, and I messed up, and I messed up. And I was like, until he was in his late 50s. Ah, yes, we're going to need that. Thank you, standard man. So, anyway, the stories of choices, and he was telling me this. It was very sad, but fortunately, he said, for the last, uh, since I was like 57 to 87, I now know what God wants me to do. Okay, so it ended on a high note, and he says, I'm convinced, I know what God wants me to do now, but I made bad choices, bad choices for that. Anyway, so let's talk about what does the Bible teach us, some principles of making good choices. We want to lay a good foundation here. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians, it's a short one, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Okay, do we have blue mic on over there? Okay, make sure we... Ah, right. Pray right. without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That's the first one. And tied in with that, James 1, mm. verse 5. Okay, James 1, verse 5 right here. Thanks for the, moving those mics around. So pray without ceasing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Ah, I love those last words. And it what? Shall. shall be given. Not maybe, it's a slight possibility. No, it shall be given him. Okay. So, uh, first step is pray. Would you agree with that? Uh, many times we do things and then we pray because we've messed up. Uh, next step, um, Isaiah one nineteen. Okay. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Okay, if you are what? Willing. Okay, and with that is Matthew 7, verse 24 and 25. Matthew 7, 24 and 25. All right, right there. Okay. Matthew 7, verses 24 and 25 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Okay, that one has so much in those two verses. But the main point, it starts with the willingness. Okay, he who is willing, and of course then it transitions to being founded upon the rock. Uh, Linda and I have a little saying that that happens in our lives repeatedly, and we kind of joke about it. It's the moment that we are willing to do it, especially something really difficult, then it turns out that we don't have to do it anyway. Anybody else found that out? I see, like, you struggle, I don't want to do it, Lord, I don't want to do it, and even, uh, okay, you keep being impressed, and then eventually, I'm willing to do it, and then it's not necessary. It's funny, isn't it? But you know what I think, tell me if I'm right or wrong, God is developing character in us. That's the beauty of it. Okay, when we, we find it out so many times, that's it. So, number one was prayer. Number two is what? Willing. 
willing. Keep those. We're going to give you just key words. Prayer, willing. And by the way, willing ties move on to the next one. It talks about founded on the rock, which ultimately is Jesus Christ. But let's talk a bit further. Psalm 119, verse 105. Okay, so prayer, willing to do it. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Okay, going to the word. So firstly is prayer, we're willing to do it, and now we get to the foundation. And there's another verse that ties in with that. Who's got Second uh, Timothy 3, verse 16? Second Timothy 3, 16. But you notice I tried, I'm glad people on both sides uh, participate. I looked both sides there. So Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, there it is. Again, so what are the three things so far? Number one, prayer. Number two, willingness. Number three, scripture. Scripture. We've got to go back to scripture. The foundation of our decisions is the Bible, Bible based. Let's go to number four. And that is the fourth one, fourth principle there. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Okay, right here, Brad. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Okay, and then tied in with that, we'll go Isaiah 58, verse 11. Isaiah 58, verse 11. Okay, over there, Kathy. Isaiah. These go together. There are two passages that we have for each one of these major four principles. 58, Isaiah 58, verse 11. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. I went to a mechanic once. <clears throat> told me, there's nothing wrong with your car. I said, there is. No, there's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. He, he put it up. He said, oh, just a few loose heath shields. I trusted him. And I was on my way to a funeral. Dro- drove two hours and about ten minutes before the funeral, the gearbox backed up. And I, the car, Honda, was trashed for about $200. Took it to the junkyard. I trusted my mechanic. It was an old car, but it worked well. Trusted my mechanic. And he kept telling me, it's okay. And that's the problem. Sometimes we trust human beings and they don't come through. Anyway, uh, going to switch gears here, choosing friends, and we're going to have you participate now. Friends. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33 is the foundation, and then I'm going to have you start sharing a little bit here. 1 Corinthians 15.33. We've given the principles now. And uh, first, a hand, 1 Corinthians, who hasn't read today, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Anybody? Oh, right up here. All right, thanks. <laughs> First, yeah, there's a mic coming right here. Uh, so appreciate it. First Corinthians 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Okay. Do not be deceived. NIV, uh, evil or bad company corrupts good character. Ooh. little confession, sharing with you. This is the reality, how it is. I was a theology major, studying to be a pastor in South Africa many years ago. But I hung up with guys who were nice people, I thought. We went to the same school. (laughs) And I remember the Sabbath with embarrassment. But uh, my parents, by the way, were missionaries to the island of St. Helena. Some of you have heard St. Helena Island. If you know your history, Napoleon Bonaparte was banished there. Of course, a century or two centuries before my parents went there. Okay. But uh, they went to St. Helena. And of course, uh, my sister had died by this time. And I was alone. And uh, not an excuse. A reality. When you're lonely, you look for friends, right? And I began to hang out with guys who were fun. We went camping. But I remember that Sabbath, we went to church, and they said, hey, after, uh, where are you eating lunch? Well, you know, I was a single guy trying to go to college and surviving. My parents were on the island. And so I said, yeah, hey. They said, come over and eat with us. I went to have lunch with them. Older brother, Michael, and then down, Robbie and Ivan. Those three were at our same Adventist school. We were going to school together. I was the college student, and they were the high school students, and the youngest was in elementary school. 
school. And by the time we were done with lunch, I heard kind of a talking. It was a Sabbath afternoon. Are you with me? And I said, what are you guys talking about? Oh, we're going to the matinee. Does anybody know what the matinee is? The theater, the afternoon show. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And guess where I was on Sabbath afternoon? At the matinee. Why? Friends. Now, I can't, I'm, not, I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying the reality is the Bible is true. <laughs> I hung out with these guys. I heard what they want, were doing, and I want to do, stay friends and want to do, hang out and do what they did. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad, but the story, unfortunately, doesn't end there because our lesson today is about the choices we make impact others. I could have been a positive influence on those boys. I wasn't. I've asked the Lord to forgive me. As I grew in my own experience, I realized bad choices I had made. And I came to the United States and studied, and then I heard about Michael, the oldest son, got killed. Driving the company he worked for, guess what? It was a liquor company. He got killed driving a liquor truck. And I look at that, and I think the choices that we make impact others. And I rue the day I didn't, I wasn't a good influence on them. Praise the Lord, Robbie came back. Robbie left the faith, and years later, I heard he was back, and not only back at Athlone Church, he was now an elder. And I was actually supposed to preach somewhere else or whatever, and I made sure I could stop at the church just to go and give Robbie a hug and greet him, and I praise the Lord that uh, God brought Robbie back. But Michael had died in in a truck accident working for a liquor company. Bad company. Anyway. Anybody else want to share something? That was a little bad news, good news story, (laughs) but uh, bad company. Anybody else want to share a good story or something about this lesson? Yes, Stan. Uh, I, too, um, kind of fooled myself into thinking that I could hang out with the in crowd, but yet um, I could maybe be an influence for good. And uh, unfortunately, often they influence me more than I influence them. And uh, I, like you, have asked for forgiveness. Yeah. Oh, we're so thankful. We, at the beginning of our lesson and introduction, we mentioned that, thank you, Stan, that we made bad choices that impacted others. And I added the lesson correctly pointed out, but thank God there is forgiveness. <laughs> there is redemption. There's, God is good. <laughs> Oh, and it's so good when you see how God overrules the choices we make sometimes and uh, turns those things around. Anybody else? Yeah, so this is a hard part, I know. It's hard for us to admit that uh, we mess up. At the beginning, as some of you are still coming in, I mentioned briefly about my sister, my only sister, who turned, would have turned 70 this year. And I just uh, would share a little bit about that right here. Because one of the choices, which is going to be studied in lesson number six, so we're, not going to, we're just going to mention it. It's talking about choosing a life partner. Okay? And when we think about that, uh, my sister, by the way, married one of my classmates. He was attending the same school. He made some bad choices. I say that. I knew the guy. He was my classmate. <laughs> and I'm saying she made a bad choice. Are you with me? <laughs> and not only was my classmate, he was my friend. <laughs> he was my buddy. But I knew it wasn't a good choice. Made a bad choice. He was, quote-unquote, an Adventist by name. It wasn't long before he was more friends with the bottle. You know what I mean by that? Basically, an alcoholic with, you know, the rest, abuse, etc. And uh, long story short, she passed away at 25. Too much stress in her life. She was running, doing three jobs looking after three kids and putting a husband through school simultaneously. Okay? One was a full-time job, two part-time jobs, raising three children, a one-year-old, a fi- three-year-old, a five-year-old, and trying to put her husband through school, a husband who was uh, barely a Christian, much less a Seventh-day Adventist. The stress, way too much. 25 years of age, she died. Choosing a life partner is extremely important. That's coming up in lesson number six, but they just alerted us to that. 
And then, of course, choosing a career. Again, this ties in ironically with the today. I'm going to be sharing a, a little bit about what Linda and I have been called by the Lord to do. The lesson says this. At some point, we have to make a choice about what we want to do with our lives in terms of a job or career. Now, I went a little step on the toes of the lesson people. The 40, 50 years ago, it was a job or a career. They say nowadays, everybody seems to go through at least three or four careers and job choices major transitions. But if you go back 40, 50 years, you chose a life work, a career, and uh, you stayed with it. In, in Japan, for life, you work 40, 50 years. From the time they start their first job, they become part of the company, part of the family. Of course, we know that nowadays things change a lot. Um, but uh, we do this all for the glory of God. So when people ask you, what do you do? Tell them, I serve the Lord. No, no. What's your job? Oh, that's just by the way. <laughs> you see the difference? So making a choice or choices about that are very, very important. Um, ultimately, of course, it's that we are here to serve the Lord. Now, I want to share with you, I'm going to go to our teachers quarterly because there are stuff there that I have not really, it's not in our lesson, but very important lessons. And I want you to, more, to be thinking about this. The average person spends more time researching which computer to buy rather than which ethical system to live by. Think about that for a moment. Isn't that true? Okay. Or sometimes even a, a cell phone, you spend more time doing that. And I realize we are all creatures of habit, cultural trends, peer pressure, emotions, habits, preferences, convenience. They all factor in. Okay. And we make choices based upon that without even realizing it. We just make those choices. Um, and then later on, we rue the day. Why did I spend so much money for this? Because they said it was on sale. Now, I'm not just stepping on the women's toes here. Men do the same. So men don't laugh too loudly. <laughs> okay? Right? It was on sale. Did I need it? No. Oh, no. Think about that. The choices we make. Um, uh, what is the basis? Now, think about this. This isn't the teacher's quarterly, so you don't have it in front of you, most of you. But I want you to think carefully. What is the basis? The teacher's quarterly uses the word, the basis for making choices, the basis for Christian ethics. I mean, I really, I didn't think that, that this is what it was, but I think they're right after I read it. What is the basis? Don't be afraid to be wrong. I was wrong too. The basis, the basis. The Word of God. The Word of God. Okay. They call that... Uh, they don't use that as the basis. They use that as the source. Ah, you understand? So they'll come to that. Not the basis. But so, yes. Try something else. Experience. Experience. They, that will be more the results of our choices. Yes. And sometimes it can be a good experience or a bad experience. <laughs> sometimes we learn from it. Sometimes we don't learn from it. So the basis. And only, if you haven't read the quarterly, if you have, <clears throat> go ahead. The uh, the thing that I got out of the lesson was that it is a it, it is a life process. It is um, it is something that we live by, and we make our decisions based on the way we live. Um, and, and I may be off the mark a bit. I don't know, but when we accept the Sabbath, when we accept healthful eating, when we accept all of these fundamentals, they become a lifestyle choice. And this lifestyle's choice is the way that we live our lives. And so our decision-making should be a part of this. It is, it's interesting. I'm, I've been reading these uh, Bible stories for bedtime story to my grandchildren. And uh, we've been studying um, Joshua. And when Joshua first went into Canaan and after the fall of Jericho, mm -hmm. he started making his own decisions. He didn't consult God. And so... Because of that, uh, Achan got by with what he was doing, right. and then when they went to Ai, people died. And that was on Joshua's head. Right. And he began to realize that he can't make a choice without first going to God and finding out what God wanted to do. Appreciate that. And that ties in a little with, with Doris's point, the experiences, etc. We haven't quite gotten to what the, they call the basis. And uh, I'll admit it's a little more challenging. There's a hand, go bud, and then up here with the head. 
Unfortunately, our choice was because of personal lust and wants and desires. And we don't always line everything up with the Word of God. And that's something we learn as time goes on. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well said. Reiterating what some of the points we're making correct. Uh, okay, Ted? Um, I'm, uh, it, it's a little bit, for me, it's a little complicated because there's, to me, two ki- kinds of choices that we make in life. Okay. It's choices based on our knowledge regarding, for instance, when I go to buy a car, yes. it's based on my knowledge regarding the, 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 whether I'm going to buy this type of car based on my knowledge base. Other choices that I have to make are based on a moral value, my relationship with my creator. And, and if I don't have a relationship with him, I'm going to make a choice, good or evil. If I, don't, if I have a relationship with him, then I'll make a better choice regarding that type of thing. So it's dependent on my relationship with him, whether I make a good choice or a bad choice, as far as my moral values are concerned. Good point. And, and by the way, that helps to differentiate somewhat those two issues, and I appreciate that. Uh, although, to some degree, the car you buy is also based on your relationship because you wouldn't go and buy a Maserati or a Ferrari when you need just a Pinto. Isn't that right? <laughs> okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we're stewards. Are we to follow? So ultimately it is. You still want to make sure you are using God's money that he put in your care correctly. But the foundation, here's the basis. And you've gone, this is what the, the lesson quarterly in the teacher's quarterly called the basis. Essentially is that and they use the technical Latin term, the imago Dei, the image of God. We are made in God's image. And because we are His children, that relationship ultimately is the foundation, the basis. That's the word they use to describe it. The basis is the fact that we are God's made in His very image. And that relationship comes down to that. Jan, you you raised your hand? <laughs> uh, what are we going to say? Be careful. We, we talk to Buy a Pinto might not be the best oh. <laughs> car on the basis no. of I, that stewardship. Came to, sorry, that came to mind. Uh, just uh, I, I didn't plan that. For you. It was something that slipped out. Apologies. I should have said, uh, I was going to say a Beetle, but that was my wife's first car. I want any, any little car that's not a Ferrari. How about that? Uh, but it's still down to the relationship. We want to use the stewardship. Marie, yeah. The basis, remember the basis is that personal relationship because we are God's children. The whole thing is that basically we make decisions like every two seconds we make a decision of one kind or another. So one decision can be insignificant like brush your teeth or get out of bed. But there are those decisions we have to make in terms of our relationship with God if it's for the benefit or we do it for the other reason. Correct. Ah, oh, correct. And you know what? Again, the, ultimately, even the brushing of teeth, which is almost a non-issue, if we don't brush it for the next three years, okay, <laughs> then you're paying big time down the road. Again, stewardship is the issue. But you're right. The, what apparently are the smaller things can eventually become large issues. So you're right. They are almost automatic. Yes, Stan? How often do... Um how we see our parents make choices affect our choices. Ooh, yes. I don't want to go there. <laughs> There's a hand. Thanks, Al. Rescue me. <laughs> All right. But uh, yes, yes. Our choice, which is just sometimes so ingrained, we don't even know it until they say, you are just like your mother. Or you doing just what your father did. <laughs> the, the Bible is very clear and specific. Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from them. Yes. <laughs> so we have an awesome responsibility, don't we? Oh, oh, yes. I know. Uh, you're right. But there's, a, there's one little passage that gives me hope. I just thought of it. I think it's First Kings 14, verse 8, that says, A child shall not be punished for his parents' sins. That's a little bit of hope, is it, that one? Maybe it's not that one, but there's a verse there. I've got what it is now, but you know what verse I'm talking about. Yeah, so, yes, we have to... Uh, now, one more thing. On this basis, because we've talked about the source. The source is the scriptures. But the basis, uh, just last, yesterday or the day before, Linda and I reading in our morning watch book, came across the story of the pastor Sheldon. His name was Charles Sheldon, and he was preaching at his church. I think it was a Presbyterian church about 100 years ago, when a homeless man walked down the aisle... 
staggered down the aisle. He was up in the balcony. He said, I, I heard what the pastor said. He, was, he used to sit way back there, and he came up, and he said, very interesting. I, I, I like what he said. I'm just paraphrasing. And he said, I have been in this town for the last three months. And uh, this is interesting what he's been preaching, what Christians are supposed to do. But nobody has greeted me. Nobody has helped me. And he collapsed and died right there in church. And from there onwards, that whole church had a huge wake-up call and began to now say, what does it mean to be Christians in the town? And out of that came the book called In His Steps, the story of the church that began to actually put into practice what it mean, means. And from Charles Sheldon, that famous four-word WWJD came out. What is it called? What would, Jesus do? what would Jesus do? That's where that initially, that phrase came from there. So when we talk about the basis, we are children of God, the relationship, the question is always, what would Jesus do? That's what we have to ask ourselves over and over again. What would Jesus do? And you know, there are times we have to change uh, and, and uh, rethink, rethink what we've done. Um, we are Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm going to touch on it briefly in my sermon. We believe in all ten commandments, okay? All ten. And as we dialogue with other Christians, we sometimes remind them that it's not just nine, it's ten. But here's my question. The Ten Commandments, see if you can remember the rest of the phrase, the Ten Commandments are a reflection of God's character. And God's character is love, okay? <laughs> the Ten Commandments are a reflection of God's character, which is a character of love. So think about that in the choices we make. Am I making those choices because, by God's grace, the relationship back to you, what you... I want to reflect the love of Jesus more and more to draw others to our Savior. This week, I had the chance, uh, somebody's been coming to help Linda and me load up. And we're going to share a little more about that and moving things. And in between, we get to talk a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I'm still a pastor, even though I'm a, I'm a packer and loader and emptier of house and all of those things. But as we talked, I, I shared this more than once with, the man who's been helping us, who's not a member of, of our church, fortunately he's free and he comes and he moves things. And I said, I have six words that I look forward to. Just six words I desire more than anything else. I don't say anybody remember it. I've said it before. It's in the parable of Jesus when the two men who had five talents and the other one who had two talents did were faithful and they brought along. And then what did he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. Six words. Six words, that's what I want to hear one day by God's grace, that because I have lived for Jesus, I have allowed him to live through me, and I enjoy it because I want to reflect God's character, that one day, those six words. And you know what? There are seven words that follow that. <laughs> Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's right, okay. The six words, <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant, are followed by seven words. <laughs> Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, so there are these principles. And you know the Bible is full of stories. Why are those stories there? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Open your Bibles. I want to go over there. I want to show a very important thing between two verses. Many people go to, too many people go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and they read verse 11. Okay? Verse 11. I'm keeping about 10 minutes for myself at the end because I have something to share with you just by way of reminder. Uh, and for those who and may not have been here, it was a, I had a whole full sermon I shared in 2016, which ties in with our lesson. So a little reminder, and for those who weren't here. But who will read who hasn't read or spoken today? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Raise your hand. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. All right. And your name? I'm Donna. Donna. I'm Donna. Donna, good. Welcome, Donna. Thank read you. Read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Please. This is from the NIV. Okay. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Okay. They're written for examples and for warnings. Okay. And, and so I have a friend of mine. I've told the story before, so I'll just in one minute, and you know the story. I called him Billy, who uh, saw the example of David who had multiple wives. And David was a man of the gods and heart, and he decided what? 
he can get more than one wife. And he said, look, I'm not wanting to take somebody else's wife. I'm looking, I'm looking for an opportunity to serve the women who don't have. There are many single women. In the Seventh Avenue Church, you know, it's like two women to one man. All right? So he said, I want to be of service, especially for single women who, who have kids, so I can be a father to them. <laughs> oh, you understand the stories of the Bible? And so people go to that verse, and they have used the verse. These are given for examples. And he, he was serious. I mean, he was very serious. He was my roommate when we were student missionaries in Korea. I, I, I got to know him before I even met Linda. And, and I talked to him about it. And he believed this so much so that he went to look for a second wife. I asked, I asked him, what does your current wife think about it? And his answer was, she hasn't seen the light yet. <laughs> okay, now, and you, you already heard the end of the story. The, sad, the story ends very sadly because... His first wife divorced him, and the last we saw him, he came to visit us in Oregon. He was a single, almost a homeless man. He was homeless, right? Yeah, single homeless. But so the question is, what are the reasons why our Bible stories say, read verse 6. So back up to verse 6. Verse 11 can be misused. Not should be misused, can be misused. These are examples, we should follow them. But notice verse 6, which comes five verses before, and who hasn't read? Raise a hand. Okay, thanks, (coughs) Jed. Now these things became our examples. To so the sounds, in- sounds the same as the previous verse, right? But notice the difference. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Ah, there it is. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things. And as we as know, the Bible is very clear. It tells us what's good and evil. <laughs> We've got the Ten Commandments. And most importantly, we have the life of Jesus Christ. What would Jesus do? How should we follow his example? Okay. So these are lessons. When we read the stories, don't simply follow that. And again, another short story, which I remember. There was a lady who had written a letter to the editor, very perturbed about something that I had written that had been published in an article by request of Dr. Mervyn Maxwell, you know, the son of Uncle Arthur, Bedtime stories, and he's written books, and he said, Ron, would you write an article, The Truth About Telling the Truth? And one Adventist wrote back, and he said, she was very unhappy because I had urged people to tell the truth. You remember that story? And, and she said, we sh- we sh- it's okay, Seventh Adventists can lie, because we know the difference between good lies and bad lies. And she identified them. She said, good lies are lies that are, that, that are told for good reasons. Are you listening carefully? Good reasons. Good motives, good aims, and bad lies are bad ones. And so I called her up. You may remember I managed to go into switchboard.com. That will date when I did this 20 years ago. And I asked her, and she said, look at all the liars in the Bible. Abraham lied, and, and she went to all the liars, and Rahab lied. You, you get the point. If you look at Bible stories, you can find an excuse for almost anything you want to do. Okay? So I did. I, 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 I talked with her, and I stopped her. I said, let me ask you a question. What about Jesus? Silence. Silence. She said this. I never thought about Jesus. Wow. What an indictment. A Seventh-day Adventist who didn't think about Jesus, who finds all the excuses of all the stories in the Bible. Are you with me? Think about that in the context of this. So when it comes to making choices, oh, be very careful with Bible stories. <laughs> Unless you take verse 6 into account. The intent of the stories is that we don't follow them when they did wrong. <laughs> one more verse. It's not in our lesson. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, and the, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Somebody who hasn't read, raise your hand. Uh, okay, remember those Bible stories we've already touched on. And this is verse, chapter 10, now to chapter 11, the first verse. A hand. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Second helping. Go for it, Doris. <laughs> Uh, I had it. Just one moment. Follow my example. Stop there. Paul says, what? Follow my example? Hold on. (laughs) I follow, as I follow the example of Christ. Ah, there's the key. Are you with me? Follow my example as I follow Christ. So the Bible characters should be followed only if they are following and doing what Jesus wants them to do. Follow my example as I follow. I'm opening up for any other questions, comments, for uh, interaction. Choices are so important. And choices that we make. Ah, A few more minutes. Anybody else want to add choices made? Uh, Even even in the family. Parents, 
Don't see a hand. I'll share with you until some. Oh, there's a hand back here. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about uh, oftentimes as parents, we try to shield our children from the choices they make. Oh, yes. Uh, we want to make it all right. I'm wondering if that's a uh, biblical way to do it. <laughs> you know the answer. It's not. Yes, it's very important, very important for children to learn the lessons of life. Okay? Might I bring up the prodigal son? Yes, go ahead. Might I bring up the prodigal son? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Ah. Uh. I'm thinking there's a lot of shielding going on there. Yeah. Any other lessons? I was just, I'd never noticed until the lesson or the story of Jonathan and Saul, how if Saul had made good choices, it would probably have resulted in Jonathan becoming king. Lesson brought it out beautifully. And I'd never thought of that. And yet, John, I mean, the context of the choices of the parent impacted the son that he lost the kingdom, yet Jonathan was such a wonderful person that he supported David in... Uh... Yes, Marie. I know that in part of the lesson it talked about sometimes that we do more research on things than just choosing our partner. For me, I, because I grew up in an abusive home, et cetera, et cetera, and I was in church, and I did my homework. I thought, I mean, I had what a spouse should be, blah, 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 blah. But I married wrong. I married outside the church because I thought that's what God wanted me to because it, things kept happening and kept happening. And, and to me, it's still amazing that sometimes we or I was delusional about my prayers and what God was leading me to. Yes. And, um, and I think we got to be really careful because the choices we make in our, in our prayers, how we think that God is answering them may not be the way God is really telling us. When I studied at Andrews, I, I went to one lady and I said, I need you on my committee. She said, what are you thinking of doing? I told her, she said, I disagree with you. The direction you think your dissertation is going, what your research is, and I was going to study on polygamy in the Bible. And she said, I disagree with you. I said, that's why I need you on my committee. She said, she looked at me, I said, I need you. So she joined my committee. And, and during the course of the committee, towards the Near towards near the end, I had two chapters. I remember sitting around the table with she was on my committee, and my chairman was there, myself, and and she said, "Throw out these two chapters," and I said, "Throw it out." I worked hard to do these two chapters. She said, "Throw it out, or I'm leaving. I quit your committee. I'm not going to be on that one." And I said, "I can't. I can't throw these out. I worked. I did the research." She said, "Get rid of them, or I leave." She got up and she walked out. She quit the committee. And I'm like, oh, no. And I looked at my advisor, and he said, it's your committee. You're the, you're the student. You decide what you want. Do you want her on the committee or don't you? I jumped up. I ran after her. I came back and said, I'll throw those two chapters out. I need you. You know that? Honestly, friends, 10 years later, I went and I gave her a hug, thanked her. I would be embarrassed to have those two chapters in my dissertation. She saved me. Huge embarrassment. Thank God I listened to godly counsel. Because I didn't even understand why she wanted those chapters out. I had used wrong method. I was, it was a terrible two chapters that I'm so glad, thank God, she got me to throw out those two, which was painful, but I'd done the research. I thought I knew what I was doing. Oh, godly counsel was I thank the Lord that I had somebody on my committee who disagreed with me. She's one of my best friends to this day <laughs> because she saved me decades of embarrassment. Tell me, counselors. Pastor, was she some more elderly? I mean, a little older? She was a Greek scholar, and I, that's why I wanted her on the committee. And she was about 20 years older, and I, I respected her. We didn't agree on everything, but I respected her. We need godly counselors. Yes, and, and we need the maturity of our friends, too, because in my 20s, I viewed differently my life as I did in my 30s or my 40s or 50s. And now that I'm in my 60s, I look back and see, wow, I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> Thank God I'll have eternity to do that. Amen. Amen. You're, you're so right. In fact, the older I get, sometimes it's like the, least, the less I know. Oh, yes. Thank God. So keep that in mind. Thank you for raising it. Godly counselors. It's in Scripture. Uh, okay. The importance of godly counselors. I'm going to uh, switch gears here. 
just to remind you, and there may be more time, living loyally for the Lord. I shared this one here, December 17, 2016, uh, and it was on Daniel chapter 3. Okay, and, and just a few principles that come out of Daniel 3. The first thing, which goes right back to Ted's point here, is they had a personal relationship with God. Our God. When the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were standing there with a choice, bow or burn, they said, if that's the case, you want to throw us in? Our God. And the first lesson I shared with is that they each had a personal relationship with God. The foundation for making right choices is that relationship. I'm glad you raised that. You didn't know I had it on my PowerPoint as number one here. The second thing they said, our God whom we serve. Because too many times, and I say, this is, they done research in the United States, 80% sometimes come out, say, we believe in God. But then you ask, now how many of you are actually serving God? (laughs) It's just a lip service, you know what I'm saying? Many Americans, oh, we believe in God, but how many Americans actually live for the Lord? Serve the Lord. And whom we serve, they had, number two, secret number two, was they had a practical religious experience with God. That's very important. They lived there what they proclaimed with their lips. They lived it, a practical religious experience, not just lip service. As somebody said, I'm a non-practicing Seventh-day Adventist. You remember I told you when I shared this before, I said, you know, just as much, I am a non-practicing bank robber. You remember that? I am. It's serious. I'm a non-practicing bank robber. You know what that means, right? I'm not one. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) I'm not one. See, you can't say I'm a non-practicing Christian. (laughs) It means you're not a Christian. (laughs) But that's with a practical religious experience. And then we study verse 17. There's another point that comes out there. Is able to. So our God, personal relationship, whom we serve, practical religious experience, is able. This is the important foundation for choice. We believe and we trust. We touched on it in our lesson. We trust in God's ability. He is able. So the third secret that I shared, going back to that sermon in 2016, is they believed in the power of God. Okay? This is all the foundation for good choices. How did those three Hebrews make such good choices? And Daniel himself. Okay? So first is that personal relationship. Second is that practical religious experience. Third, they believed in the power of God. And of course, we know the song so well. He's able. He's able. You believe that? That's the God we serve. Now, still in verse 17, there's one fourth, the fourth point that comes from a fourth secret. Okay, they said, He is able, and He will deliver us from your hand. Oh, there it is. That's right, the fourth one. So, that relationship, that is practical. They believed in the power of God. And now, lesson number four, they trusted in the promises of God. And this is so important. Again, people are saying to us, and they've asked us, in fact, as we've been walking around, a little confession here, and I always ha- have Linda do it. We see people, we wonder if they're Bangladeshi. I say, go ask, go ask. And just this last week, literally a week ago, we saw people who looked like they could have been Bangladeshi. Linda went to ask, and they said, no, we're Indian. We're Indian. 99% it's Indian. Nobody from Bangladesh, it seems. And then they... they and they asked about this. Linda said, we're going to Bangladesh. And they said, why didn't you Google it? But the way they said it, <laughs> why didn't you Google to go learn about the country? And they're not the only ones. Go and check it out. We've been warned. We've been told. It's, uh, Bangladesh is a very um, needy place and a challenging place. 170 million people approximately in the size of uh, Iowa. Okay. I'll show you some pictures in church time that I shared, uh, just a couple of pictures. So, but here's the good news. We have to trust in the promises of God. <laughs> he has called us to serve there, and we're going to go there trusting in His promises. That's verse 17. Now verse 18, lesson number 5, they added these important words, but if not. In other words, if God doesn't save us, if God doesn't come through, if not, lesson number 5, and by the way, they didn't say even if. So many times in life we say, uh, I mean, they didn't say what if, sorry. They didn't say what if this happens, what if that happens. They said, even if this happens, we'll still be faithful. Even if, not what if. So many times we, you and I, operate on what if, fear of the future. Secret number five, they were faithful to the principles of God. Back to the scriptures, faithful to the principles of God. Very important as we look at the choices. Number one, okay, they, they had a personal relationship. Number two, they had a practical religious experience. Number three, they believed in the power of God. Number four, they trusted in the promises of God. And now they were faithful to the principles of God. And here are a few Bible verses. We're going to touch on a couple of them later on in the message. 
Uh, Deuteronomy 5, verse 29, God speaking through Moses, Oh, that they, God's people, had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well for them and with their children forever. God wants to go to the heart. We're going to talk about this in our message. Okay, What does God really want? We'll come back to this verse again, Deuteronomy 5, verse 39. And of course, we as Seventh Adventists often talk about the three angels' messages. Here is the end of the last one. Read it with me. Ready? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice both things are there. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Okay, so it's not legalism. And we'll talk about that later on. And I love the way Jesus put this in Matthew 6. Again, we have been warned, cautioned by people about the challenges of going to um, serve in uh, Bangladesh. In fact, uh, maybe I should mention this here. A man who served there about 40, 50 years ago just contacted us out of the blue. We didn't realize. We've known him for 25, 30 years. He was education director at the establishment of the school. And uh, he just sent Linda some, I wouldn't say encouraging news or discouraging news, but reality news. As many of you who know the history, Pakistan was two parts, West Pakistan, East Pakistan, and there was a civil war. And one of the first places they went in, the Pakistani army, was to universities and colleges, and they they killed the professors and the students. And an Adventist who was there was shot, or the bandits also came. We don't know if it was part of the army or what, but the bandits came in and killed him, and uh, the education director, or one of the leaders, got shot in the arm. And so our friend, who was education director, just sent that news to us this week. Was it yesterday? And uh, so, you know, but the thing is, what does Jesus say? Therefore, what? Do not worry. worry, Saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For after all things, these things, what? The Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. The small things, okay, are the little things that we offer, and God will take care of us. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Back to choices. And all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, we're not being flippant about it. The reality is that each one of us lives day by day on the edge of eternity. Would you agree? So in my wallet, in my billfold, I carry with me two prayers. Then if I share this with you here before, one of them is a short prayer. May I live close to Jesus, ready to die for him today. So we realize uh, the call to Bangladesh is uh, a, a, a call from God, but we have to be faithful. Revelation 2 verse 10 says, Do not wor- fear any of those things which you are about to suffer, but be what? Unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Live by faith in the Father. If there's a motto I want to share with you here to remind you what I shared 2016, two lines. Live by faith in the Father, not by fear of the future. Motto that's so important for anyone who believes in Jesus. Live by faith in the Father, not fear of the future. We're talking about choices today, how important they are to make them in the context of a relationship with God, in the context of what would Jesus do, live by faith in the Father, not fear of the future. Okay? And of course, a few statements from wonderful books here that capture this concept beautifully. And this is talking about the three Hebrews. True Christian principle will not stop to weigh consequences. You don't worry about the results. You simply say, what does God want me to do? So you don't worry about the consequences. The sanctified life, page 39, paragraph 2. What is the motto of every Christian? Death before dishonor or transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. We just read, be thou faithful unto? Unto death. Testimonies, volume 5, page 147, paragraph 1. Uh, Two or three more statements here that capture this whole issue of making choices. What is our only safe course? Our only safe course is to render obedience to all his requirements at whatever Ah, think about that. Faithful unto death. Testimonies, volume 5, page 365. I love that, 365, because I think every day. (laughs) 365, and notice, point 2. How long is a year? 365.24, are you with me? (laughs) The whole year long. Okay, testimonies, volume 5, page 365. 
point two, that's paragraph two. Decisions, how, do we, how should we make decisions? In deciding upon any course of action, whether it be what I'm going to have for breakfast, or whether we're going to be called to go serve in Asia, as in the, Linda, the case of Linda and me, in deciding upon any course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it, but whether what is in keeping with the will of God. That's the only question we do to ask. Is this action in keeping with the will of God? This is a challenging one. My cousin, who is the education director in South Africa, he's got, at the end of his uh, email, here a beautiful statement. Christ's ambassadors. Are you an ambassador for Christ? Amen. That's right. Christ's ambassadors have what? Nothing to do with consequences. Stop and think about that. So many times, again in the context of moral decision making, or in the context of stewardship, we have nothing to do. People say, oh, but if I do that, that's going to happen. How do you know it's going to happen in the next five minutes, much less the five, next five years? Are you with me? Christ's ambassadors have what? Nothing. nothing to do with consequences. Nothing. They must what? Perform their duty and leave results with God. Now we're talking about choices. If there's one powerful statement outside of Scripture, we give you the scriptural passages, this is one of the most powerful ones, isn't it? Consequences, none of my business. In, in, in other words, consequences are inconsequential. Okay? Think about that. Do our duty and leave results with God. And I've got a minute here, a minute and a half. Uh, back to Scripture. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. Modern translation, New Living Translation. But let God transform you. Relationship again. Transform you into a new person by changing the way you what? The way you think. And what you think, you will act. As a man thinketh, so is he. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And of course, ultimately, we're called to follow in the footsteps of Christ. Read with me now. Ready? For to this you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 1 Corinthians 2.21 Ultimately, you and I, our choices must always be following. And, and then the next verse is an important one, who committed no sin. Uh, this is why, why this is important, because people say, oh, it's just a little white lie. Ever heard that? Have you heard yourself say that? <laughs> you see? Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So we are called upon to be faithful, even in the little things. We sometimes think it's little. 1 John 2.22. Okay, and here is the contrast. Oh, okay, everything that Christians do should be as transparent as the sunlight. Truth is of God. Deception in every one of its myriad forms is of and whoever in any way departs from the straight line of truth is betraying himself into the power of the wicked one. Yet, it is not a light or an easy thing to speak the exact truth. We cannot speak the truth unless we know the truth. And the last statement is the power here. Notice what it says. We cannot speak the truth unless our minds are what? Continually guided by him who is the truth. There it is. Always back to Jesus. It's always He is our example. He is our model for morality. He is our example for ethics. He is the Christ who helps us to choose well. The story of Daniel ends when the, the king sees the Son of God. They experience the presence of Jesus in the person of Je uh, presence of God in the person of Jesus. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, "Praise be to God!" And now they are giving praises to God. So I want to end with this: How to live loyally for the Lord. Focus on Christ, not on the crisis. Amen. Simple, in the context of choices, focus on Christ, not on the crisis. You and I often, human beings, we look at the crises around us and we forget the Christ. Let us pray. Holy Father, thank you for reminding us. Thank you for that wonderful, incredible story of how you worked mightily through the lives of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you, Father, for these men trusting in you because they had that personal relationship. They believed in your power, but regardless, they were faithful to your principles and they experienced in a wonderful way the presence of Jesus in the fire, through the fire. Bless us as we make choices and may it be just as Nebuchadnezzar ultimately praised you that others will praise you as we make choices. Choices based upon our personal relationship with Jesus our Savior. In his name, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.